Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Ich war seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's ein Rhythmus, als gäb's ein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Komm dir entgegen. First of all, welcome everyone. It's a lot of people in this room. It's exciting. Um, it's an exciting day, of course, for St. Louis. Um, I'm Manuel Feit, I'm the host of the Game Pressing Podcast. Phil, you're hosting the Flyover. Flyover mm-hmm. Footy. And then Krava, you're hosting the B4B mm-hmm. podcast. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about German football, obviously, because we have a German team in town. Um, I also heard there is a team in this city opening a new stadium. <laughs> Anyone heard anything about that? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so yeah, um, I was thinking we'd probably run to some topics. Well, I think you have a few on your list there. Yeah. And then we're just going to open this up to the floor. Ask us anything. If, if it's St. Louis, Bundesliga, international football, we can always try to give an answer. Love it. Yeah. Uh, so just to get some more localized topics out of the way, for sure, in preparation for this game we're about to go into, let's talk about Lutz van Schiel and just talk about the Lutz effect in St. Louis and the way he's been building this roster. And... Um, all these free transfers. I think a good heavy first question might be to talk about um, all the, the free transfers we've gotten in, which is perhaps in the positive category for St. Louis fans. And a lot of the hate that's been coming in is spending so much on someone like Berkey. And I feel like those two items are somewhat related. I thought I'd get your thoughts on that. I don't think they spent very much on Berkey. I mean, he came in on a free transfer. European, you didn't, we didn't spend much, but in MLS, it was quite Well, a bit. no, but it's a salary, right? Yeah. Um, I think that that's a really important thing to point out here right away is that the, the, the only thing that was spent on him is the salary charge. And the salary charge is what, 1.4, 1.5 million? So he doesn't even qualify as a designated player. Right. So this is not a scenario where um, I think Tim Howard was a designated player for... He was Colorado. Colorado, the Rapids, thank you. And so you're not exactly taking a huge risk here on, on wasting a DP slot. Um, what I also think is really interesting, and I think this is really important actually in, in the context of this, when you, there's, there's in a very big stats I call goal impact. And what they calculated is that actually goalkeepers are the cheapest way to improve your roster the most because they have the biggest impact in terms of what you get for, um, you know, goal impact. This basic measures how much a, team, a player adds to, to the winning, the winning percentage. And so I think it's actually a pretty good business overall. Um, so I didn't understand the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, I think that was something constructive because someone maybe didn't necessarily understand what was going on here. But Lutz is, comes from Europe and he has a different mindset in that regard that he, and he is a former goalkeeper and he thinks that you have to build the team from the back out. And that is, that's the way a lot of German teams do it. You look at Borussia Dortmund, you look at uh, Bayern Munich, they're all built from the back out. And this is why he brought in Roman Berkey. This episode of the Gegenpressing Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Basketball is back. And Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And it's your continued source for all sports wagering information. Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to promo code BLEAV, B-L-E-A-V to receive your rewards. That's it. B L E A V to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. And Ernst Tanner even said a few weeks ago, even after that controversy started, uh, how valuable a goalkeeper is. And it, it almost sounds like he's looking at similar stats to what you just mentioned. So, well, yeah, I think it was actually brought up with Philadelphia, right? That, yeah, that yeah. With Andre Blake, that and he is. I mean, talking about a keeper that has a huge impact. Yes, they didn't win. They didn't win the the MLS Cup. Um, I was actually joking today 
with someone about this that uh, if Max Crippo doesn't break his leg, <laughs> Philadelphia probably wins the wins the MLS Cup because the McCarthy, a, a goalkeeper that is good at penalties, comes in. But I was actually the, the point that I was trying to make then is then Crippo with Cri- with Crippo and goal, the White Cups would have made the playoffs mm. because it's that's the two or three points that they're missing, right? So I I don't understand the controversy about it. Um, I mean, you know this cover with Borussia Dortmund. How many years did they look for a goalkeeper that can be even close to Manuel Neuer? Because like that was often the difference between them and Bayern Munich. Oh, absolutely. And and Berkey spent you know eight years at Dortmund and still uh, struggled a lot. And but we we have a top goalkeeper now in the MLS. I mean, obviously we have a proven Champions League player. And going back to Lutz, I mean, he has he's obviously European, but he brings so much passion and he's so involved in this city already. I mean, even going months back, I'm part of this City Futures program where we coach anywhere from six-year-olds up to 14 at one of the few of the high schools here in the city. And Lutz has showed up to these, just watching kids and, and making sure they're having a good time, making sure we're doing the development right and implementing a good philosophy and making sure that it's community-based so that the city is, you know, taking things seriously and we're making sure that we want to be a top club in the MLS. I, I can't get enough of Lutz so far. Absolutely. And I'm curious if you could talk more about um, the players he's brought in and how you think the build has looked so far. Obviously, you, you're in North America, you're covering North American leagues. And so I'm really interested that you're perfect to ask about all the international players we brought in, as well as some of the MLS players we just picked up. Yeah. So actually, full disclosure, I spent the morning with Lutz. <laughs> <laughs> a little biased I, as we are. Um, I, got to, I got to see, I got a tour of the training facility and there is going to be something on on that training facility. I'm going to work on a feature and it's going to be very quote heavy. Um, I was very impressed with what I saw. Um, this, it's not just the roster build is what I'm trying to say. Um, but the roster build is obviously something that's very important. Um, I got an anecdote told today that is going to make it into peace that he's, when they first started here, and it's not just Lutz, this is the technical director of as well, right? And they just drove all over Missouri to try to find talents for for the MLS Next Pro team. And uh, one of the things that they did, they, they ended up somewhere in the outskirts of St. Louis, <laughs> literally in the cornfields, as they said. <laughs> and they did pick up a player um, from that team that they scouted that day. But look, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. And um, this is not just something that is cobbled together overnight. They had an extra year where they spent a lot of time looking for talent around in this region, um, where they put together a facility that is attractive for players, both from the region, from North America, but also on, from abroad, right? Um, some of the stuff that I saw today is is what Man City do or Bayern Munich have, right? The facility is on that same level, and that's very, very impressive. Um, about the players that he brought in, you know, I think what what he's looked for is a not too old. Um, you know, he doesn't want to sign anyone who's nearing who's over th- 25 unless there's uh, special circumstances. Players that are signed on a on, on a relatively little money. Um, even the one DP that they have, Joe Klaus, he's a player that next year they can buy down, right? Um, and as a player who, at I think he's 25, 26. I think you have the roster here. Um, can still increase his market value in the years to come. So that, that's mostly what, they look, what they're looking for, right? And Nicolas Giorgini is another one who they actually didn't think was available. Mm-hmm. Um, they were surprised that he was available. And when he was available, they did actually have to change a little bit the way they were going through the draft. But that's a great pickup. He's a player who has been part of the U.S. national team in the past, who has a pedigree in Europe and is looking to repair his career and is now coming to a team that he really wanted to go to. And I think that's the sort of pickups that you will see. And he's done that in Hoffenheim as well, where he worked with Ernst Tanner. And Ernst, you all seen what Ernst Tanner has done with Philadelphia. And I think you will see a lot of the similarities here. I think two players that we haven't seen, I'm going on my experience here, but the two players that I haven't seen enough of, we saw a lot of them with City too, so we kind of have an idea of what they're going to look like. People like Ostrock and, um, you know, pardon me, Berkey, of course, we got to see here. But I'm really curious about Eduard Leuven, and um, the one we haven't seen yet, Rasmus Alm, who isn't signed until January. You corrected us the other day yeah. on Twitter. But can you tell, uh, tell us about those two? Well, so I don't know much about Sweden. <laughs> Same, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been told that there was a couple teams in Germany, and one team in Belgium that also wanted him. 
Um, he has, he's known him personally and that's how he was able to get him. Um, I've been told he's very fast, very good player. So I can't say more than that. I'm just quoting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Leuven is an interesting one because Leuven was a player who was with the uh, German uh, youth setups, the national team youth setups. Um, has a Russian passport as well, right? So a really interesting background there. Um, but he is someone who actually was projected to go through the roof and then there was a few things where he just, he needed a reset in his career. And I think this is exactly what's coming here. This is essentially him giving him a platform to reestablish his career, play a few seasons in MLS. And then, you know, if things go well, you know, he could have the kind of impact that Hani Muchter had in Nashville. We, we, same kind of hit background, right? Came over here at 24, 25, was a player who was always kind of bounced around, finally found a home, finally found a place that trusted him and his market has gone through the roof. And I think with Eduard Löwen, although they play in a different position, yeah. it's the same kind of impact they're looking for. And I want to talk about position. Matt's going to like this one. Um, he was labeled as a six. We play with, uh, you know, obvious, uh, typically with a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A dual pivot, pardon me. And, um, so I'm curious what he might need next to him. Like we have a big hole at center mid and right back. Maybe you can come on, come in on that as well. But what will we see in Leuven as far as his style of play? Yeah, he's, he's more defensive minded, but he can move the ball really quickly through midfield, right? Sure. So I, I'm, I don't know what they're planning to do next to him. I mean, they could also, I think the big focus now is on domestics. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they don't know yet what they're doing next. Um, I know that in terms of right back, there, there was options at the draft that fell through at the last moment. So they, they basically had to go back to the drawing board, but they want something, someone young. Um, and I think for a lot of the positions, they want someone young. And it, it, you have to also see that it could be someone from the MLS Next Pro team coming in, mm -hmm. right? Um, that depends on certain players maybe getting a green card, being allowed to stay here. Yeah. You don't want to waste one of your three left international spots on one of those players. So. Yeah, it's going to be going to be interesting what to do there. Um, I don't know. If I knew, I would tell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we break some news right here in this room. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the three international slots. And last time I, we spoke, no plans for that per se. But you want to protect yourself in the draft by having that option, it sounded like. Yeah, and I think it's, it's also a nice option to trade away later on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a wasted purchase. No, in any of way. course not. And they only paid 150000 um, general allocation money, GAM, GAM dollars, <laughs> uh, or GABA bucks. Um, so there's, they, they can do a lot of things with it, right? And there might be teams that in the summer want to bring in a big name player and all of a sudden they need an international spot and St. Louis has one lying around mm -hmm. and then you can do something with it. Love an it. Asset. Um, what kind of one last thing about St. Louis, uh, the nerdy questions before we move on to Bayer Leverkusen. Um, you know, the, the five expansion draft players, Joe Keeney, John Nelson, John Bell, Indiana Vasilev, a couple interesting, and then the trade away of LaCava for Tim Parker. A couple interesting storylines there. I recently heard some good things about John Bell, who's kind of one of my favorite pickups, but maybe you can speak about the expansion players. Many of us haven't seen a lot of these guys' minutes. And I know Bruce Arena was really pissed. Good. <laughs> yes. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know he was really pissed. Um, he didn't want to lose Bell, but I guess then you need to protect him. Yeah, it's um, his fault. <laughs> Once he left, they need to still find a deal with Aston Villa. Yeah, right. They own that player, so they need to they need to buy him. Um, but Bell is one that they're really happy with, and I think a lot of people around the league. I mean, uh, Tom Bogart was another one who commented on on Bell being a really really smart pickup. So that, I think there's a player that people can be very excited about. Awesome. So let's talk about Be Bayer Leverkusen. And um, we don't, let's assume we don't know anything about that. That's probably not true in this room. But what, what do we expect to see from them today as far as maybe the style of play? Yeah, I mean, Alonso's come in, right? He's changed a few things. Um, he's finally picked up some wins, Rina Rono. Um, and I think that's the point that you, you see them make quite a lot. That they're four points from the relegation zone, but and you notice Kava, there was only five points from our European spot. Um, it can go really quickly right now in the Bundesliga. And um, Alonso, I think is finally, when, when I talked to him this weekend, or sorry, this week, I guess it's not really the weekend, but um, you got the sense that 
he's finally trying getting a handle on this team and one of the big issues Leverkusen's had all season long is that it's a very mixed group with different nationalities and characters mm -hmm. That can be great, but that can also be bad because like that mix sometimes when you have too many cliques in the dressing room means that not everyone always pulls at the same strings. And I think that's what ultimately did in Gerardo Sione, um, who they really liked as a manager. They still highly respect him. Everyone I talked to at Leverkusen said like they, re they really regret having to fire him. Um, and he will land on his feet, he will get another job in the Bundesliga, but they felt because the, the way the group was put together and maybe they made the mistake of not moving one or two players on in the summer, that happens, right? Um, they felt that it just wasn't possible for Sione to get to reset the chemistry. And I think that uh, Javi Alonso coming in as a fresh face, um, with a, different, a little bit of a different playing philosophy, the Spanish playing philosophy, right? Mm -hmm gives them maybe a little bit of a reset. And I'm pretty sure also that they're going to do a few things in the January window, you know, ship out some of the players that they wanted, they hung on wrongly in the summer and then move them on. And um, now that they're only five points away from a Europa League spot, they're in a very different position because now you can sell a player and saying, hey, look, we could still make Europe. And then you're as a club in a very different position of buying players, right? Do you think Schick is going to be one of those players that they potentially offload? Oh man, they could have gotten 70 million euros for him in the I summer. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> no, the arrow's pointing down on transfer money. <laughs> that's usually bad. <laughs> the arrow points down, that's usually a bad sign. I mean, what do you think, Kava? Should they have moved him on? In the summer? Yes, I absolutely agree with that, yeah. Do you think Dortmund should have bought him? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, See, we talk about Dortmund after all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> no, let's. Uh, I think some of the players, obviously, Schick stood out. Stood out. I, I, unfortunately for He's you, I listened to the Total Soccer Show from July, and so it was all your predictions. Uh -oh. And now we're halfway. <laughs> we're halfway through a season, and uh, I have some receipts for some of your comments. Damn, man. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I didn't know there was receipts. <laughs> <laughs> Should have never agreed to this. Uh, but you. You liked Bayer at the, at the, in the offseason. Yeah. You really thought they were returning a lot of players, that they were going to do well. Um, it didn't go so well, but I think um, one of my favorite players, as you mentioned, Schick versus um, Lozik. Adam Lozik, I apologize mm -hmm. for the pronunciation. Oh, that's actually bang on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, the two really interesting players. I love the confusion that people think they're going to be the same because they're both Czech. Obviously, that's, that's not the case. Same nationality means same player, right? Yeah, right. I think so. <laughs> I think all the Americans in German are the same. Okay. So. In Germany, pardon me. Um, but uh, will we see him today, do you think? He's not at the World Cup, so maybe we might get to So we're not going to see Sheik. He didn't travel. Pardon me, but Lozek is playing, yeah. Wonderful. It sounds uh, like so a really they, cool they, player. They brought 16 players, and all 16 players are playing. Awesome, I've okay. got the list out somewhere. Uh, maybe Johannes, you have the list? Uh, typical. <laughs> <laughs> you bring a sidekick, and he doesn't have anything on him. <laughs> I think the 16, like, what we've been told, 16 players have come on the trip and all 16 of them will play and Wonderful. Schick isn't one of them um, but you, I think the only exception is Wirtz he's not going to play he's here but he's not playing because he's he's just started contact training um, he, he's come back from a very very bad ACL injury right um, he's, he looks great I spoke to him yesterday um, but he's not at a level yet where they're comfortable playing him um, which is fair enough yeah, I think um, Americans, I watch a lot of Bundesliga, and so the Bundesliga seems like a very athletic league. Uh, speed seems to be very valuable. You know, Frimpong and uh, Diaby are two of my favorite players. They're two of the fastest players on that team. Um, so outside of athleticism, outside of pressing, uh, that we kind of tend to expect that out of any Bundesliga club, Do you, anything we might expect as far as tactics for Bayer today when they play? I'm kind of curious about that myself. So... Um by the time this, if, if, if you listen back to it, obviously, then uh, this will be already out in the Substack. But I am doing a thoughts piece on, on this game and it's going to come out in the final whistle. And I'm kind of interested to see myself, because the nice thing of sitting in the, in the press box is that you have that really nice perspective from the top, right? And you really get a really good idea of how the teams line up and, and what it actually looks like tactically. I've seen Bayer Leverkusen on TV uh, uh, under Alonso. I have not seen them live yet under Alonso. And mm. this is my first time seeing them live. So... This is kind of a thing where um, I want to be careful with my assessment because 
just read my Substack. <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> it, it will I'm be on there. Just, I, I just want to really see what it looks actually like when you have the full perspective of the entire pitch, because you see things off the ball that are, that you usually don't notice on TV, right? The, mm-hmm. the, the camera always follows the ball, and I always like this perspective. You like to see what the, the center backs are doing, what the cent- what the center, the double pivot is doing. Is a single pivot? Is a double pivot? What are the right backs? How are they moving? The left backs? How are they moving? Right? W- what is the attack doing? So. I, I'm really curious about that today and um, really looking forward to what Alonzo Ball actually looks like in person. I love that. And it shows how lucky we are in St. Louis to have such a world-class club coming to St. Louis for this game. We get to see them in person. You're a well-traveled soccer journalist and you're excited to watch this team live. So that's awesome. I'm actually excited about anything that's happening today. I mean, first of all, we had a great, we have a great crowd here, right? Uh, there's a Great crowd outside um, the St. Luligans, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the stadium is amazing. Um, I, we, we were lucky enough to see it uh, yesterday. Um, it's a beautiful facility. It's a perfect size. Um, I talked to some of the buyer guys and they were saying, that's the, that's the best thing you can do um, for a market like this. You know, you, when you go to... When you go to some of the smaller markets in Germany, they, it's the same thing. Their stadiums are twenty-five to 30,000 people, you know, and they're sometimes the most difficult places to play. You look at Union Berlin and how, how good they have been this year, and they play in one of the smaller facilities. Um, just before um, this, this fall, I went to Freiburg and I wrote a long story on them and how well they have done um, this season. They're second in the Bundesliga, of course, right? And um, their facility is a lot like this. It's, it's smaller, it's compact, it's a little bit bigger, 30,000 seats, but it's, it's from the design, it's very similar, and it's, mm. it's intimidating to play there, and um, that's what Bayer Leverkusen and a few pe- players pointed out to me, they're saying, these places are often more difficult to play, because like, whether it's 20,000 or 60,000, doesn't matter if the fans are close to the stand. It's, it's difficult either way, right? So, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing the stadium, and, and hear the atmosphere there. I think seeing a stadium filled with life is always great. Yeah, and we hear Lutz saying how we want people to see the arch and tremble with fear with the uh, amount of energy they're going to have to exert to play our team. So that's that all definitely plays into it. I love hearing that from you. Um, yeah, let's stay zoomed out. I'm curious, Bayer Leverkusen, we've heard about rumors about Aaron Hurd and how he possibly could go over there, perhaps a, um, a relationship. Uh, so the city of Bayer, the city of St. Louis. What? Leverkusen. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Byers the company. <laughs> Leverkusen, pardon me. Um, but yeah, Byers plays an integral role in both cities, yeah. Leverkusen and St. Louis. And so, um, yeah, can you compare the two? And, and then we'll have one, maybe one more question after that. Yeah, so I, Leverkusen is a very different place than St. Okay. Louis, right? Leverkusen was literally founded by the, by the company. Um, there was just a tiny little harbor on the River Rhine there. And then the, the founder of uh, the buyer company decided this is a great place to put a factory. And then the town kind of grew around it. Um, this is the industrialization in Germany. So I guess that's, a, that's maybe one parallel to St. Louis. I know the Mississippi plays a really big role here, right? Um, the, this is the heartland, industrial heartland of America. Um, I think the slogan heartland against Deutschland is, is a good one. Um, just walking around the city, I think you see a lot of old money here which is maybe a little bit different than, than Leverkusen, right? Where, you know, it's more of a city of progress and like technology and so on. But you do have that connection with the buyer company and you do have the connection with industrialists. And I think um, it makes sense for Leverkusen to be here um, and to, to build a relationship with this club because obviously you also have to buy a Leverkusen. Um, I think it's the science crop headquarters are here. Uh, you now have a direct flight from Frankfurt to yeah. St. Louis, um, which is which is huge, right? Um, so I hope lots of you are going over there to watch Bundesliga games. Yeah. <laughs> make make sure of that. Uh, so make use of that connection. I think it's great. Yeah. Oh, we should just stop there and do some questions. Um, anyone want to come up and ask a question? We have, in fact, my mic will be fine for that, right? No pressure, and by that I mean all the pressure. Get up here. <laughs> the first is there any receipts? <laughs> Who else listened to that podcast? <laughs> I have, uh, if no one has a question, Josh Sargent and Tim Ream. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. St. Louis boys making the World Cup. Yeah, I've been told there's no Premier League questions on this podcast. Oh. <laughs> fair, that's fair. <laughs> no, uh, I'm serious. Josh has improved massively, right? And Tim deserves this. He really does. 
All right, I guess I'll break the ice. I have two yeah. questions. So I have a question for the St. Louis guys and then for Manu. So for St. Louis, um, we have a pretty well-established uh, academy here, Gallagher, right? I haven't seen, if, I don't know if you guys know if there's any sort of connection with this, with the club here and with Gallagher, if there's any type of relationship there, because they've sent a lot of uh, players out to Europe. Uh, I know Utrecht, and for example, uh, in the past. So it seems like that would be a, a good um, integration. And for Manu, um, I've just been looking at the Bundesliga schedule and, and what things look like after the World Cup. And for teams like, you know, Dorman and Bayern who have a lot of players at the World Cup, you think the late start's going to help or hurt uh, compared to other leagues um, in Europe? Yeah, so I th for Bayern in particular, a lot will depend on um, how deep this Germany team goes. I think uh, this, this German national team is essentially a Bayern Munich plus. Mm -hmm. right? Um, Bayern Munich, six, six Bayern Munich guys and a bunch of other guys that also made the team. Um, and I think if Germany do go deep in this tournament, they, it could be a hangover. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what that first game um, against RB Leipzig will look like, right? RB Leipzig is the emerging team. Um, and I could see Leipzig closing that gap really quickly. Leipzig sucks for the players, but for the team, it's actually great news. Nkunku out, Timo Werner out. Those two guys will be fit come, come that match, January 20th, right? Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that's going to impact Bayern um, over some of the other teams. Uh, Bayern is also sending a huge French con contingent. So it's, it's really interesting. We've never really been in this situation before. We had World Cup hangovers at the start of seasons. Mm. Um, and Bayern Munich usually have a hangover at the start of the season anyways. They did this year. They did last year. And what if they have another hangover and all of a sudden Leipzig wins five, six games? You know what? I'm a, I try to be as neutral as possible. I would love that. I think Johannes over there from the DFL would love that. <laughs> He's nodding. Uh, yeah, it would make our lives a lot easier. Um, maybe not great for the Bayern fans, sorry. But <laughs> but yeah, I guess my, my long answer short, it's going to, I, I'm really curious about this too, because we just don't know. It's uncharted territory, isn't it? Um, I heard someone here was a fan of uh, Muziala. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of Muziala tweets from this man this week. Um, uh, about St. Louis Scott Gallagher, yes. It, a massive academy. That's where Tim Ream came from. Josh Sargent came from. There's a picture of them when they were both like probably eight or something uh, that came out this week. Really amazing uh, to see Josh Sargent as a young kid, little ginger with freckles and red hair. It's perfect. But um, no, it's a bit of a loaded question, but let's just say that Dale Shilley used to be the head of the academy at St. Louis Scott Gallagher, and he now works for City. And so if we thought that was going to be a bit of a troublesome situation, stealing players, for instance, came out a little bit, you know, about a year ago. Um, now I think it's simmered down and I think there's going to be a official and unofficial working together or not. You know what I mean? There's going to be a, a, some pull and some push and pull there. Uh, but I do think it's peaceful now and I think that's good for St. Louis in general. So I look forward to it. Yeah, to piggyback off that, I'm also curious to see the relationship between Gallagher and the academy. I've seen them play uh, against each other at Lou Fuse. But I noticed talking to coaches over the past few years around the St. Louis area, I mean, everyone is constantly talking about how competitive it is at every single level. I mean, even at like seven years old. And, and just like um, he was saying about teams trying to steal players from different teams as well. I mean, it's, it's a very competitive market at the moment. So I'm, I'm curious to see if which ones are going to gel and which ones are going to become, I guess, rivals. Rising water, right? Any other questions? We only get this guy like, this is it probably. <laughs> yeah, Matt. So a lot of people in St. Louis may not have been as familiar with you before you started breaking every single player rumor signing. Not every single one. Just about every single one that we had up until a few months ago. He's not let's be, let's be honest. <laughs> so of the ones that you did break, uh, knowing the style of play that Lutz may like to run, who would you say that you are, who piqued your interest the most? Maybe like a player or two that you were really early on the rumor train. You, you knew they were being signed and you were like, oh yeah, this is the guy who, I, I want to follow him. Ostruck. Yeah. Ostruck. Exactly. 100%. Um, I know Köln are still pretty peeved about this one. <laughs> uh, I know that Bayern Munich wanted to get him for his academy, for their academy possibly as well. Um, he's a great player. I think he's not going to be here long, sadly. So if you're buying shirts, don't put his name on the back. <laughs> um, because he's really good. 
And I'm not saying this in a demeaning way, but he's the sort of player who plays a few years in MLS and then moves on, um, which is fine. You know, that's where MLS wants to be. Um, but he's really good. He's a really good player and I'm really high on him. And I, I know that a lot of people in Germany were really surprised when he chose this route. Uh, I know that Köln were really unhappy on how it went down. And I know a few agents were said to me afterward. When I, when I started breaking it, I had a couple of agents call me. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> it's like because like he could sign at this and this club and I'm like well he's just signed for St. Louis like I, I wouldn't put it out there and then lo and behold it, it got confirmed right and the agents were like how how did Lutz do this and uh, I guess he came up with a good plan and showed, showed, showed the player development path and here we are so now it's I guess up to the player to walk that path but I think I'm really excited to see him play another DP uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, well, ask you about a, a, a situation close to your heart, uh, the Canadian national team and the World Cup. Um, I know just to get a level of uh, uh, the excitement in Canada for, for their appearance and how is uh, Alfonso Davies doing currently with his injury? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Uh, I start with Fonzie because I actually did speak to Fonzie last week uh, as part of our round table and um, he seemed very happy with the way his injury was going at the time. Um, he said that, you know, he, at, the, at the, that point he still had pain, but he, he's, he's getting to a point where he was very confident that he would reach 100% fitness by the time the tournament comes around. And I remember writing that article and posting it on Twitter and you could feel a collective sigh around Canada because <laughs> the, the, any hope this, that this team has to get out of the group stage is based on on him, right? He is the best player CONCACAF has ever produced. Um, and I, I know this might be a controversial take in the US and Mexico, but I, I think it's not. I think he is the most talented player ever to emerge from this region. Um, and so much is dependent on him. He is for Canada what Bale is for Wales, right? Um, as for Canada, that group is really hard. It's a really hard group. Um, we are all hopeful that they get out, but when you look at it rationally, I don't think you should have realistic expectations to get out of that group because Belgium are very good. Croatia is one of those teams that could go to a World Cup final again. And I looked at that Morocco team for a preview podcast that I did and we went through the squad and we're like, man, every single one of these guys plays in a top four league in Europe. Every single one. And it's not just a team in the top four league in Europe, it's a top 10 team in a top four league in Europe including their Canadian-born goalkeeper, which is very annoying. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, realistically, I think this is a great opportunity for a team to learn what a World Cup is like. And then when Canada hosts the World Cup, be ready for it. And I think there's a lot of people in Canada with unrealistic expectations. I think you guys are probably really familiar with that here in the States. Um, but I think a lot of people are just happy to see the team there. I'm curious what you can say about what you know, the relationship between Leverkusen and St. Louis. Um, you know, Phil talked about Aaron Hurd and the supposed pipeline to Leverkusen. Um, we've heard some things about sharing coaching philosophies, but is there anything you can tell us about the relationship between those two clubs going forward, what that might entail, and maybe specificity behind um, player transfers one way or the other, or just how the nature of that relationship is going to evolve. So I can't say any more than what I, that what I wrote yesterday for Forbes, that um, we, I asked Fernando Caro, the CEO of Leo Kuzin, about this, and he said, let's play this game first, and then we'll see. Um, I asked people at St. Louis about this as well, and they said the same thing. Look, um, we both know, we all know the buyer is here, the company, um, I think there is work done to find some sort of relationship, but I really don't know what that relationship at the end of the day will entail. Um, whether it is sharing coaching philosophies, uh, whether it's Leverkusen having access to academy players produced here, I, I don't know. I would have to guess. Um, I know that all of this is on the table and all of this is being discussed, but I can tell you that none of it has been decided. 
So maybe you can say about the Dallas and Bayern, Bayern Munich situation, how do they feel about that? Because in some ways, maybe they don't want to be locked down here in St. Louis to give every single player to them first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe, I don't know how Dallas felt about it this in the last two years. Well, Dallas has made some pretty good money of it, okay. <laughs> in, in fairness. Um, and Bayern Munich regularly passes up an opportunity to sign Dallas players. Ricardo Pepe is the most confusing, interesting one, maybe. Um, but Chris Richards did earn... Justin Che, too. Yeah, yeah. There's, a yeah. There's a lot. But Justin Che is at Hoffenheim now. Yeah, yeah. But he did go originally to Bayern Munich, and then they couldn't agree on a deal because, like, in the end of the day, Bayern Munich still has to pay a transfer fee. And then when Chris Richards went to Crystal Palace... Um, a significant percentage of that fee went to FC, um, FC Dallas, right? So I don't actually think that is the worst relationship to have. I know that Bayern Munich um, are looking beyond that relationship now on the North American market. They don't feel that Dallas is necessarily the right kind of club to work with. They had difficulties working with Dallas as well on some of the player transfers. So they're, they're actually considering maybe moving on to a different partnership. Um, but Leverkusen, I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether that's the blueprint for them or whether they just want to work in terms of exchanging ideas on the academy level. I guess, you know, to be quite frank with you, I don't think they know themselves yet. Um, and I think there's something is going to happen because it makes sense. Why wouldn't it? But I really don't know what. Very much apologize for uh, monopolizing this, <laughs> but I'm curious, and I, I do apologize again for. This is a very pointed question, and I'm apologize for that. <laughs> Klaus and Leuven are our designated players. You obviously follow MLS, at, you know, from Vancouver. You you know what the the system, the importance of a designated player is. In your opinion, would you say that St. Louis has wisely used their DP slots on Klaus and Leuven? Yes, because they can pay they can pay Klaus down next year. And we don't even know what the DP situation looks like next year. We don't, like, I think there is some rumors it's going to change. So I wouldn't really hang up on it, right? Rumors the DP rule could change. Well, you never know with MLS. I mean, um, I, I talked to someone today who's in charge of the salary cap at an MLS team, and they were, they were just shaking their heads. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't know. I, we, like, this is this is one of those things where I would have to just speculate, and um, so I'd rather be frank and said I don't know um, what the rule is going to be like. But I think that you're in a very comfortable position with Klaus as a designated player because worst case you buy him down. It's not like what Vancouver did with Cavallini; they couldn't extend his contract for next year because they would have been on the hook for two point eight million dollars, yeah. and that would have been crazy money. So they walked away, right? Um, which I think was the right thing to do. But when you go back to when the deal was signed, I mean, that's a crazy commitment. Um, I don't want to say it's a stupid commitment, but it's definitely one that I wouldn't make. And I don't, this, this is not the situation that you're finding yourself in here. This is not um, a situation where there's been bad asset management. Part of it in MLS speak is that they're being paid um, more than Berkey because of the transfer fees, right? And so the idea that they can be bought down, you're saying that that over the life of their contract is going to play in City's favor a lot better. You know, we sound a lot of like lawyers when we talk about MLS. <laughs> but yes, you are 100% correct. The transfer fee does factor in, in the... So if you're paying, let's say you pay 5 million, right? Um, I'm just pulling a figure out, out of thin air here. Um, oh, let's make it three, so make it easier. So one million, if it was a three-year contract, one million of that fee goes onto the... So that's, that's why they couldn't... Because of the transfer fee, they couldn't buy Klaus down. Because that was initially what they wanted to do. They wanted to sign him on a below-designated player. But I think it was even something really small, like a couple hundred thousand, that they were just above. And, um, yeah... But, you know, he doesn't want to sign Hollywood guys anyways. I think he's pointed it out in some article. <laughs> Based on the current players that are on the roster, how would you, uh, what would you expect the city to do for the first year in MLS? So on what they have right now, um, again, I want to see what else they're adding. I want to see what MLS talent is getting added to the roster. I want to see what they're doing with the international spots. I know this league can be hard. You know, Charlotte, for example, I think really underestimated with their roster build, what, they, what, this, what it means to come into this league. 
Um, obviously, you had Atlanta United come in and do really well in their first year. Uh, Inter Miami actually made the playoffs in their first year, and then it turned out they broke the rules. Um, yeah. But uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, the, the spine looks very strong, and it's going to be interesting to see what the, the different players added to the roster can do. You have to remember, yeah, reaching the playoffs is going to get more difficult because you have more teams now. And I don't think the MLS has changed the playoff format because of more teams. So it's getting harder. But I mean, at the same time, I'm pretty confident that what is being put on the field is of high quality. And um, let's see what, what, what happens with the roster before we maybe make any judgments on what this team will look, what this team can do. I think at least Lutz has mentioned a few times in the last few weeks too that he's he's really looking for specific players that have the right mentality and have good attitudes and have high work rates too. So I think we're trying to implement that core identity into the squad of having players that want to work for each other. And as you uh, Manuel mentioned before, that we have a good spine in the team and we're doing a good job of building from the back there. So I'm very excited to see what else we can add to the squad here. I had two quick questions here. The first would be, this is more Bundesliga. Where do you see the relegation battle being this year? Obviously, Schalke's been rough. <laughs> Bochum's starting to show some fight again. A lot of those teams, Hertha looks much better than they did last year. They, they're competent, at least. Is, is that going to be pretty much shot of Schalke down, and then we'll see? Or do you see anyone else really struggling? And then the second one, I know you're an 1860 fan. Oh, man. What are That's your thoughts on them the next <laughs> few years? It, are they going to be back in the second division? Um, I'm a reluctant 1860 fan. <laughs> I, I wish, you know how I became an 1860 fan? I, I made the really dumb mistake as a six-year-old to ask my dad what his favorite team was. <laughs> he had said 1860. I so wish he had said Bayern. <laughs> my life would be so much easier. Um, no, look, 1860 is, is a great club. They play in a fantastic stadium. Uh, it's a decrepit old stadium, but we love it dearly. Uh, it's a great atmosphere. We pack 20,000 people into the stadium every, every match day, no matter if it rains, snows, doesn't matter. This place doesn't have a roof for most of, most of the... It's a, it's, a, it's a concrete ball. It's going to finally get renovated, but it's, it's an ugly, beautiful stadium. I love it dearly. And when I, when, when I do go home, I don't report on 1860 because it's not something I can do. This season started very promising and the last few match days have gone really badly. I think the best news is that there's a break. Um, so I'm still hopeful. It's only one win away from a promotion spot, right? And uh, I am still hopeful that maybe one day I'm going to see them in the Bundesliga where I think they belong. When you look at the, the size of the club, the fans that they bring, they, 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 I think the 11th biggest team in terms of traveling support in Germany. Mm. You know, it's a big club and they do not belong where they are right now. Um, but it's tough. Once you're down there, it's really hard to get out. And that's, um, um, yeah, that's the struggles of being an 1860 fan. As for the relegation battle, I love the fact that you think that Hertha is competent now. I think that's that's a huge improvement. <laughs> this is, uh, Schalke look in a bad place. Um, I had some hopes that they would stay in and it's... Survival is going to be really hard because the teams around them are improving. Bochum has looked pretty good. Um, and it's really hard to say. It, it's so weird because I, we're judging the Bundesliga like it's halfway, but really we're only on match day 15. And um, so we're two games shy of, of the halfway point. Um, and then you have this huge break now where for two months these teams are going to basically go back out to the drawing board. So I think it's really hard to say what's going to happen, what Schalke are going to do. I think Thomas Rice is a very competent manager. He did turn things around with Bochum. I think he played really good football with a Bochum side that should have been by rights relegated last year, right? Um, so I, I think there's time to turn around, but it's going to be very hard. And as for who else is going to come in there, it's anyone really, you know, f from Augsburg, Hertha, all these teams some surprise team, um, someone who thinks they're safe now um, could just slip down. As I said, Leverkusen have four points from a relegation spot and five points from Europe. It's tight. Anything can happen. Hi, hey guys. This might be a bit off topic, but I'm sure you've seen Welcome to Wrexham. And if you have and know about it, do you think it's a good thing, bad thing? Is it a one-off or is it a trend that's just starting? I have not watched it, um, 
but I think Ryan Reynolds should focus on teams closer to Vancouver. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they cost too much. That's the problem. No. No. <laughs> I There's would. two struggling teams in Vancouver that are crying out for help. <laughs> I would. I would love if he brought back the Ottawa Fire, though, or the Ottawa Fury. Pardon me, Fury. Um, yeah, that's funny. I mean, I think that kind of TV sells. It's, it's, I mean, it helps that he's the star and then the other guy's a star, but yeah, um, it's good. So Until I Die had no stars and it was incredible. It was similar, right? So I think it's just good TV. If you got the money to produce a good product, you can make some, some headway. And also it's Ryan Reynolds. I know, exactly. Easy. That was an easy one. We should probably close up though. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, I want to say thank you because we were part of your first, this is a historical day. So we're part of that. I love that. Manuel Ve, cannot thank you enough for, yes, thank for you speaking very much. to us. All right, thank you for having me. And I really hope you enjoyed our city. I loved it. So far it's been great. I love the arc. I didn't die in it. That's great. Well, yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> um, no, it's been, it's been great. You guys have been very welcoming. The city of St. Louis has been awesome. Um, I also want to say thank Schlafly. I've been here yesterday. Um, they were really welcoming to made us try a bunch of beers. It's a great brewery. Um, so if you're in St. Louis, come check it out. German approved. German approved. There we go. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a good have a good game day. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.